Paul's going to read his lecture. Then there will be time, hopefully quite a, a lot of time, for open discussion in which we can take up those themes that he raises. Um, the title of the lecture is going to be The Birth of Histories from the Spirit of Mourning. And uh, I'm really happy to welcome Paul Connaughton to give the lecture for the Methods of Sociology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very generous introduction. Why do we produce histories? When that question has been asked, it's not asked very often by historians, but it's asked more frequently by philosophers and anthropologists. When that question has been asked, one answer which is frequently given is that histories legitimate a present order of political and social power. Now, it's not all that difficult to see why that answer has been found so powerful and so persuasive. Because all institutional authority needs some form of firm and reliable accreditation. It needs that retrospectively and it needs it prospectively. Retrospectively, authority needs to be able to point to a proper descent. Like the chief protagonist in The Importance of Being Earnest, it must be able to justify its existence by reference to legitimate ancestors. It's not enough to have been found in a, a handbag. And it should at least be able to muster something like the 20 generation genealogies claimed by the Talensi or the king lists of the Sumerians and Egyptians. Prospectively, authority needs to be remembered appropriately. Rather like the young child whose survival depends upon not being forgotten, rulers have an overriding wish to outwit the threat of oblivion, and they will seek to usurp the future as well as the past with narrations of their famous actions, documents in their archives, buildings to affirm their glory, and memorials to their deeds. Hence, the legitimation thesis. So, who would argue with that? Well, as a matter of fact, I think some might. Consider, for example, the extraordinary dance floor which visitors can find in Charleston in the United States. It's the product of a collective enterprise by the artist Houston Conwell, the poet Estella Conwell Majoso, and the architect Joseph Tapache. Much of the building space in which the dance floor is situated has been left sparsely furnished. The wooden roof is supported by three wooden columns. The windows are uncurtained. The walls are of bare brick. Architectural reticence directs attention towards the floor. Unlike most large public buildings where great care has gone into the overall design, the floor, not the walls or the ceiling, is the dominant element in the building. The brown wooden floor is the site of an artwork, painted with indigo, blue and white made from local oyster shells. Here you will find a detailed map of places that have been important for centuries in the lives of African Americans. The map represents an elaborate narrative, a lieu de mémoire. This map is a cosmogram of mourning. It depicts an image of a water journey, retracing the trajectory of a horrible itinerary, from the waterways along which the slaves travelled from the Rochelle River in Sierra Leone, across the Atlantic Ocean, through the Caribbean Sea, and into Charleston Harbour. 
It depicts many sites of suffering in Charleston itself. The houses on Sullivan's Island, which provided the initial quarantine holding places for enslaved Africans. The slave market, where thousands of enslaved Africans had to endure the indignity of the auction block. Boone Hall Plantation, the site of enslaved Africans' living quarters. The hanging tree, where many enslaved African Americans were executed. Middleton Place Plantation, the burial site of enslaved African Americans. But the Cosmogram also represents, as iconic places, the sites of slaves' resistance. Sullivan Island, the site of Cato's insurrection, one of the earliest occasions of resistance among enslaved Africans. Fort Sumter, where the first shot of the Civil War was fired. Morris Island, the burial site of Colonel Robert Gould Shaw and the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, the first African-American military unit to fight in the Civil War. Jenkins Orphanage, helped, uh, founded to help African-American young men a site which later became famous for its jazz band. So the artwork on the dance floor has a double layered meaning. As a dance floor, it is a site of celebration. As a visual narrative, it is a site of remembered grief. As a representation of a subaltern group's shared grief, the memorial dance floor in Charleston invites comparison with another collective enterprise, the AIDS Memorial Quilt Project. It was Cleve Jones who conceived the idea for the project, which was launched in the 1980s. He had asked participants in the annual march in honor of Harvey Milk to make some placards bearing the name of someone they knew who had died of AIDS. And the sight of the massed placards, all hung on the facade of the federal building, reminded him of a patchwork quilt handed down within his family and used to console those who are ill. Formally organized on the 21st of June, 1987, the Names Project was displayed a week later in San Francisco's Lesbian and Gay Freedom Day Parade. It consisted of some 40 panels, each one three by six feet in size, corresponding approximately to the size of a body or coffin. In October 1987, when the Names Project was displayed for the first time on the Mall in Washington, Panels extended over an area the size of two football fields. Five years later, at the display of October 8, 1992, the official count exceeded 20,000 panels. And two years after that, the Names Project began the task of photographing every quilt panel in existence. Only seven years separated the invention of this ritual and its archivalization. The opening ceremony of folding and unfolding the panels inevitably recalls the military procedure of folding and unfolding the American flag, and so is designed to evoke the idea of a second imagined community on a national scale. The choice of white clothing for those who unfold the quilt panels has come to take on a symbolic significance. Symbolically charged too is the roll call of the names of the dead at all quilt displays when community leaders, family members, lovers, friends and AIDS volunteers read the names aloud. The reading of names, the signing of signature panels, 
the ceremonial walk through the display, all are ritually orchestrated. But nothing is more heavily impregnated with symbolism than the material out of which the quilt panels are constructed. Diverse materials are often drawn upon. Cloth, leather, items of clothing, photographs, wedding rings, teddy bears, dolls, cowboy boots, credit cards, computer-generated graphics, cremation ashes. The AIDS quilt comprises not only quilting but also applique, embroidery and spray paint. The era of the AIDS quilt, you could say, is the second great age of collage. Malleability is a presiding motif and informality is insistent. If in many cases the name of the deceased is noted legally, as on a birth certificate or a tombstone, often the names inscribed are private rather than public, first names and nicknames. Cloth, above all, is the privileged material because it is yielding, because it is not stone or bronze or steel. When a memorial is made of stone, stone or bronze or steel, the rhetoric of the material implicitly claims that the memory of the dead recorded there will last forever. Cloth carries no such illusions of enduring witness. It is fragile, it fades and frays, it needs mending. It remembers the dead by sewing together mere fragments of their lives. Cleve Jones pointedly drew attention to this material contrast at the 1988 Washington display. Today, he said, we have borne in our arms and on our shoulders a new monument to our nation's capital. It is not made of stone or metal and it was not raised by engineers. Our monument was sewn of soft fabric and thread and it was created in homes across America. The dance floor at Charleston and the AIDS quilt exemplify, I think, a particular kind of mourning. Or rather, to be more precise, they illustrate a form of mourning whose distinctive feature lies in its antecedent circumstances, those of a historical catastrophe. My subject is histories and mourning. But I exclude from the very outset many particular occasions of mourning. Specifically, I rule out of account all the mourning customs which have been so extensively studied by social anthropologists, who have shown that, while cultural patterns differ greatly in what they encourage and what they forbid, and in the extent to which the ceremony of mourning should be elaborated or curtailed, in virtually all cultures, rituals and rules exist regarding the way in which the grief attendant upon the death of loved ones is expressed for determining how a relationship with the dead person should be conducted, for prescribing how blame should be assigned and anger expressed, and for stipulating how long the mourning should last. The kind of mourning I have in mind has to do not with bereavement customs of this kind, but with historical traumas. That is to say, with those circumstances of mourning where the benefit of rituals and rules do not obtain and cannot be drawn upon as a repertoire of practices and an emotional resource. The historical traumas I'm referring to may entail one of two broad types of suffering. 
There is, first of all, the suffering that results from very extreme conditions. This could be exemplified by survivors of the Holocaust, or of the atomic bombs dropped on Japanese cities, or of the depredations of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. And then there are more routinized forms of suffering, against which certain categories of persons are relatively protected, but which, to which others, the poor and the defeated, are especially exposed. Experiences of deprivation, of exploitation, of degradation, of oppression. Sufferings of this type might be exemplified by the losses endured under apartheid, or by the enforced migration suffered by political refugees, or by the chronic under underemployment to which particular social classes are exposed. Perhaps the examples I've cited suggest that these two categories of suffering, those resulting from extreme conditions and those of a more routinized nature, are not really quite so easily distinguishable. That at the margins, the one type tends to blend into the other, and that we ought therefore to think of both types as exemplifying a broad category, that of historical catastrophe or trauma. Those large-scale events, so widely recurrent in the history of peoples, that pose questions of identity and call for ways of coming to terms with the losses they impose and the legacy they leave. Mourning customs can sometimes be invented in response to these catastrophes, as the sites of mourning that proliferated in the wake of the First World War show, and as perhaps the Charleston dance floor and the Ace quilt also illustrate. But it is a distinctive feature of such historical catastrophes and traumas that they precipitate cultural bereavement for which mourning customs are often difficult to find or invent, or which are widely felt to be scarcely adequate to the immensity of the bereavement, and where the emotional responses of the bereaved lack the formalized channels which might, to some extent, ritualize and contain those responses of loss and grief. My suggestion is that in the absence of bereavement customs, people turn to histories in order to cope with an otherwise uncontainable experience of loss. And that both the dance floor at Charleston and the AIDS memorial quilt, as well as being rituals, are also examples of such histories, and therefore they could be said to be, in Clifford Geert's sense, blurred shore. These, I would say, are not legitimating histories. Rather, they are histories of mourning. Could it therefore be that the legitimation thesis is less persuasive than it is sometimes assumed to be? Let me then briefly, in the light of this question, pass in review some types of history which might be thought of not as legitimating histories, but as histories of mourning. The sense of cultural bereavement animated the efflorescence of historical studies which began a quarter of a century after the Norman Conquest and continued until about 1130. The dates are not coincidental. Historical studies were a response to a crisis in national affairs. No aristocratic society in Europe, between the rise of the barbarian kingdoms and the 20th century, with the possible exception, 
of that which fell victim to the French Revolution, had undergone so radical a change so rapidly as England experienced after 1066. The old English aristocracy had disappeared. The English language, until recently the medium of a large area of religious life, was no longer in use among the upper strata of society. The literature, prayers, rituals, legal procedures, which had employed this language, was becoming unintelligible. The only people who were in a position to observe and to express their reactions to these changes were Benedictine monks in monasteries sufficiently old and sufficiently wealthy to have an acute sense of the difference between the past and the present. They were the only members of the old community who could understand the documents in which much of the evidence of the past was preserved, and the only ones with any hope of marshalling resistance to further depredations. To do that, they needed to reanimate the image of the pre-conquest past. And these were the circumstances which forced scholarly monks to become historians. The imaginative reconstruction of the monastic past grew out of the impulse to regain lost lands and to preserve those that remained. Canterbury, Malmesbury, Worcester, Evesham, Durham were the outstanding places in the movement. Eadma, Woolston, John of Worcester, and above all, William of Malmesbury were the outstanding names. They collected charters, they transcribed documents, they studied monastic buildings and inscriptions, they wrote the histories of estates and biographies. William of Malmesbury used the materials of every monastery he could visit in the course of his extensive journeys, or from which he could get information to make a survey of the entire kingdom. He, like all the other monastic scholars, found a common thread for his work in the memories of small communities accumulated over several centuries. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that out of their local knowledge and their local materials, these historical scholars were responsible for bringing the entirety of Anglo-Saxon history into existence. So, the birth of histories from the spirit of mourning. There is another moment in the history of historiography which is entirely dominated by a sense of cultural bereavement. That distinction belongs to Jewish historiography in the 16th century. This is hardly surprising. If one is searching for a discourse of historical mourning, it is surely to Jewish culture, if anywhere, that one should look. And yet, until the 16th century, Jewish writing had not taken on a specifically historiographical form. In the Jewish literature of the Middle Ages, much thought is devoted to the meaning that might be discovered in the long story of Jewish tribulation and the prolonged exilic status of the Jews. But the desire to find some meaning in the sufferings of the Jewish people was insistently schematic rather than strictly historical. For many centuries, Jews displayed no more than a very superficial interest in the historical events themselves. Their meditations on past tribulations never issued in historiography as a distinct genre of writing. For many centuries after Josephus, no Jewish writer even called himself a historian. Even major events were to be understood, so it was thought, by being subsumed under familiar archetypes, ritual archetypes. If Jews composed chronicles of the Crusades, 
They were less concerned with the investigation of any particular historical episode than with emphasizing the overarching image of Abraham's preparedness to save, sacrifice Isaac. The response to historical catastrophe was not to chronicle events, but to compose penitential prayers. Ritual, not chronicle, was the preeminent channel through which the memory of the group was transmitted. Always the leitmotif was provided by a schematic contrast in Jewish historical experience, a contrast structured around the polarity of two great historical departures, marked by the terms Jerusalem, Egypt, Exodus, Exile. So it might seem puzzling in light of this that the flourishing of Jewish historical writing in the 16th century was precipitated by two later historical departures. The Spanish expulsion of 1492 and the flight from Portugal in the early 16th century, when Jews still living in the Iberian Peninsula were left with no alternative but to take refuge in a more hospitable country. The magnitude of these traumas shifted the shape of Jewish responses to catastrophe. That the Jews perceived the Spanish expulsion as one of the pivotal events of world history is evident from the fact that 16th century Jewish calendars ascribed it a special status along with the creation of the world, the exodus from Egypt and the destruction of the temple. That Jewish historiography did in fact receive its main stimulus from the Iberian catastrophe cannot be doubted once we recognize that, within the span of 100 years, 10 major historical works were produced by Jews. Solomon ibn Verga, Abraham Zaguto, Elijah Kapsali, Samuel Usque, Joseph Harkoin, Gedalia ibn Yahya, and Azaria de Rossi. And that of these eight historians, five were either exiles from Spain or Portugal, or descendants of exiles, and one of them, Elijah Capsali of Crete, was greatly influenced by Spanish refugees who had come to live on that island. After the early Crusades, after the expulsions from France, after the persecutions in the wake of the Black Death, after the massacres of 1391, after the wholesale enforced conversions of 1412, the expulsions from Spain and Portugal had concluded a cascade of tribulations and precipitated among the Jewish people a profound spiritual disturbance and prolonged self-questioning. Was their suffering to be endless? Was there any discernible purpose in it? Some Jews now came to think that an answer to these questions was to be found not in ritual penitence, but in historical inquiry. Among those who sought that type of answer, perhaps the most prominent were Solomon ibn Verga and Samuel Usque. Not because they told tales of woe, but because they told them in a distinctive way. Solomon in Verga's book, The Sept of Judah, published in 1554, was the earliest sociological treatise on the Jewish question. Samuel Usque's Consolation for the Tribulations of Israel, published in 1553, and addressed to the people of the Portuguese exile, is notable for its historical meticulousness. Solomon Ibn Verga wants to understand why it was that the Jews were singled out as the target of persecution. And he concludes that they were so regarded not by the Pope, who appeared rather as their friend and protector, 
nor by the kings of France and Spain, nor by other men of prominence, nor by the educated classes, all of whom were friendly to the Jews, but by the populace, whose credulity and jealousy was goaded on by the priests. Samuel Usque assembles an account of what he calls the calamities that had befallen the Jewish people from 317 to 1553 in England, France, Germany and Bohemia. But it is especially when he comes to write about the Iberian expulsions that he produces work which is recognizably that of a historian, citing sources in Hebrew, in Latin, in Italian, and describing events from personal observation and from the accounts of eyewitnesses. So it was that a specifically historical awareness dormant among the Jews for, for some 1500 years was reawakened and that historical writing came to be viewed as a guide to the perplexed. Once again, the birth of histories from the spirit of mourning. The work of mourning pervades yet another significant body of texts whose defining feature is their desire to bear witness to the Holocaustal events of the 20th century. It has been said that if the Greeks invented tragedy and the Romans the, the epistle and the Renaissance the sonnet, the generation of the mid 20th century invented a new literature, that of testimony. The genre of testimony is animated by historians' impulse. Survivors need to tell the truth about a historical catastrophe. What is the origin of this need? Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi have provided the two most persuasive answers to that question. For Wiesel it resides in a sense of indebtedness. For Levi in a fear of annihilation. The survivors' sentiment of indebtedness means that, however much they may feel the tongue of a voice within them telling them to stop mourning the past, they find themselves visited by an even more compelling sense of obligation to serve as the emissary of the dead. The survivors' fear of annihilation has nowhere been more poignantly conveyed than in Levy's account of his recurring nightmare in Auschwitz, in which he is telling the story of his incarceration. But his listeners, his sister included, are entirely indifferent to his story. When he repeated this dream to a fellow inmate, he discovered that many others who were incarcerated with him had to endure the same nightmare the same ever-repeated scene of the unlistened-to story. For Wiesel, not to transmit the history of their disappearance would be to betray the dead. For Levy, not to transmit the history of this his annihilating experience would be the ultimate annihilation. Once more, the birth of histories from the spirit of mourning. Alongside the genre of testimony, there is yet another literary form which seeks to give expression to a generational sense of cultural bereavement. This is an exclusively German genre. It is, as uh, Clift Geertz would say, another blurred genre. And it consists in part of autobiographical narratives and in part of extended obituaries. These two elements are woven together to shape what might be called historical reports. The reports do what the psychoanalysts Alexander and Margareta Michelich claimed the Germans of their generation appeared incapable of doing. 
1967, the Mitchellics argued in their book, The Inability to Mourn, that on the evidence of the two decades that had elapsed since 1945, the Germans, though capable of an economic miracle, seemed incapable of any sustained emotional confrontation with the legacy of the Nazi past. Perhaps this was because that past was buried but not dead. In any event, the Mitchellist point is that the Germans were unable to cope with the damage to their narcissistic identification with Hitler as father figure, and that they could not mourn their own immense losses. Their argument is not entirely convincing. To a degree, it is undermined by the marvellously elegiac writing of Gunter Grasse's Tin Drum, published in 1959, and in addition, by the huge success of that novel. But if, with this major exception, the generation who experienced the humiliation of total defeat as adults produced no tradition of mourning texts, their children certainly did. The new type of literature they created, commonly referred to as father literature, literature of fathers, is, you might say, a reply to the claim made in the title of Mitchellick's book, The Inability to Mourn. Fata literatur does nothing but mourn. Its practitioners mourn the wounds inflicted on the psyche of the author by the fact of the father's defeated condition and by their emotional response to that defeat. This is the burden of Paul Kersten's The Everyday Death of My Father, of Ruth Raymond's The Man in the Pulpit, Questions for My Father, of Siegfried Gauch, Traces of a Father, of Heinrich Wiesner, The Giant at the Table, of Peter Hartley, Love in the Afternoon, of Brigitte Schweiger, Long Absence, of Ludwig Harig, Order is the Essence of Life, Novel of My Father, of Christoph Meckel, Image for Investigation about My Father. The similarity between the titles would be comical if it were not so tragic. Christoph Meckel speaks for them all when he wrote of his father, his self-confidence had collapsed after the war and had to be produced anew every day, violently, at the expense of his family. His brokenness tormented the children who did not know that his fatherhood was characteristic of a whole generation. That generation had been broken by the totality of their military defeat, by the gigantic futility of their sufferings and losses, by the destruction of the values for which they had supposedly fought, by the humiliation of being subjected to occupying powers and undergoing a program of re-education at the hands of those powers. About all these matters, the defeated were silent. They were silent about the pogroms, the deportations, the executions during the Polish and Russian campaigns which the fathers had participated in or observed. They were silent or feigned ignorance about the political and economic roots of German fascism. They were silent about the mounting resentment they harboured against the conquering power. Nothing spoke more eloquently than this massive silence. It was the admission of a toxic inheritance. Helmut Dubio once wrote that people relate to the national past as they do to a nuclear power station for whose radioactive waste no final destination has been found. The toxicity of that legacy was palpable during the German student movement of 1968, which seethed 
with a virulence present nowhere else in Europe. In France and in Germany, sorry, in France and in Italy, there were sharp political conflicts at that time between fathers and sons. But those conflicts rarely resulted in an actual break in the emotional relationships between parents and children. But they did in West Germany. Their students seldom spoke of their parents affectionately. More commonly, they spoke of them with indifference or even with open contempt. When they were approaching the middle of their lives and had children of their own, a decade or so later, the generation of Germans born during the last years of the war, or shortly after its ending, were impelled by an urgent curiosity concerning the prolonged psychological damage left in the wake of National Socialism. That was when a flood of books, articles, films, television programs, public debates about German history began to inundate West Germany. That was when, following the example set by Oskar Mazerat in the Tintrum, children came to occupy a central role as figures of identification in German cinema, in Sanders Brahms' film Germany Pale Mother, in Sieberberg's Hitler, in Edgar Reitzer's Heimat. That was when the focus of women's oral history was directed upon the reconstruction period after 1945. And that was the time of explicit mourning in Vata Literatur. Once again, the birth of histories from the spirit of mourning. Mourning extends beyond the sphere of literary texts. It is dispersed across a wide spectrum of genre. It can be found in newspapers, in cinema, in video, in painting, in photography, in songs, in festivals. We might chance upon it in newspapers. Under the pressure from Memorial, a movement founded in 1987, which has over a hundred branches in Russia and the other republics of the former Soviet Union, whose members are dedicated to laying bare the history of the Gulag system, the KGB has released photographs of purge victims. And when this has happened, newspapers in many cities usually published black-bordered columns every day with photographs and thumbnail sketches of some ten secret police victims, almost all shot in the late 1930s. Gradually, over the course of months and years, the newspaper would work its way through thousands of victims. We might chance upon morning in the cinema most obviously in Claude Lanzmann's Shah, a film not directly about catastrophe, but about the witnessing of catastrophe, made up of first-hand testimonies by participants in the experience of the Holocaust. We find it in video form, as in the Fortunov video archive for Holocaust testimonies at Yale, an archival collection of filmed accounts given to professionally trained interviewers, mostly psychoanalysts and psychotherapists, by Holocaust survivors, many of whom were enabled to tell their story in its entirety for the first time in their lives. Paint, too, has its texts of mourning. One might think, on an extensive scale, of the account given by Johannes Fabian in his marvellous book Remembering the Present, of the way in which the Congolese painter Chibumba embarked in the 1970s on the project of painting the entire history of his country, and of how he claimed to be not only a painter, but also a historian, 
how he insisted on showing and telling what truly happened as opposed to what is said to have happened. In his vast pictorial series of some hundred paintings, which can now be seen in Amsterdam, Chibomba depicts the killings and executions of African rulers, how Banza Congo of the Lower Congo is poisoned, how Maziri of Katanga is beheaded and his severed head carried all over the country until finally it was lost. How Lumbungu of Basongi is hanged, while the story of Patrice Lumumba is dramatically implotted as another passion, as the suffering of Christ. Loss is not limited here to the forfeit of sovereignty. Everything perishes including all possessions, knowledge of the ancestors, traditional languages, medicines, charms. And though Chibumba concentrates on the wielders of power, kings, warlords, politicians, prelates, women too play important roles. They suffer the indignities and cruelties of colonization. They are among the victims of post-colonial strife and as mourners they bear the brunt of bereavement. Photography too can tell of a generation's bereavement. In 1920, the photographer Ajay sold 2,621 negatives, the result of two decades of dedicated work to the Département des Monuments Historiques. Simply to list the Parisian subjects Ajay photographed in his massive enterprise of artistic salvage is to catalogue a whole city and a whole civilization half erased by Osman's rebuilding of Paris. A half forgotten sense of place mourned and located in an ambience of old streets, courtyards, squares, fountains, kiosks, cafes, bars, markets, junk shops, tramways, wagons, bridges, barges, the key is of the same. Now I think it would be an error to imagine that narratives of mourning and narratives of legitimation belong to easily separable categories. We would be alerted against any such misunderstanding if we remembered how often national groups have reinforced their internal cohesion by telling stories about the injustices done to their ancestors by other nations. Hitler, for one, was spectacularly successful in rejuvenating a German sense of legitimate identity in the aftermath of the First World War by reminding Germans of the memory of their humiliation represented by the Versailles Treaty. Both Peter Schlotterdijk in his Critique of Cynical Reason and Klaus Thevelite in Male Fantasies have demonstrated this intertwinement of legitimation and mourning in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. The former by reading Weimar cynicism as the expression of a fundamental crisis of male identity after the defeat of 1918. The latter by showing how the fear of emasculation and the concomitant attempt to bolster a sense of intact bodily identity figured so prominently in the imaginary of the fascist warrior. The massed military rallies and gymnastic displays of German fascism were, I think, a belated response to the traumatic experience of 1914 to 18. The legitimating display of fit bodies choreographed in the form of a mass ornament depended for the persuasion 
of its bodily rhetoric on the never acknowledged but unmistakably present collective memory not only of the many war dead but also and perhaps even more of the many mutilated bodies of those who had survived the lost war but who would no longer though still alive be able to form component elements in a mass ornament shaped out of human bodies. So, admittedly, those who have defended the thesis of legitimation, for example, Foucault and Lyotard, are far from being blind to the frequent intertwinement of legitimation and mourning. So we can conclude, I think, that the legitimation thesis remains persuasive only insofar as it can coexist with an acknowledgement that many histories are generated also by a sense of loss, of grief, and of mourning. The emphasis on painful pasts, on mourning, in other words, is a supplement to, rather than a replacement for, the legitimation thesis. The claim that histories legitimate a contemporary order of political and social power remains a powerful and persuasive one, but it suffers from at least one significant deficiency. It is blind to the birth of histories in the spirit of mourning.